Good evening and welcome. Thanks for joining us this evening. My name is Mark Zekutansky. I'm on the Board of Trustees of the Delaware River Greenway Partnership. We're thrilled to have you this evening and uh, we have a great program. I'm gonna introduce our speaker, but before I do that, I'd love to uh, remind you of Zoom. Uh, we have a question and answer option at the bottom. Please feel free to submit your questions. We'll touch on those at the end of the program. If you have any technical issues with the Zoom, just go ahead and put those issues in the chat. Uh, or you can respond to the email with the Zoom invitation that you received. And uh, at the end of the program, we'll get to the questions. We're also recording this evening, evening's program, so uh, you either miss a part of it uh, or you need to revisit it later or share it with friends and family. We'll be posting that to the Delaware River Greenway Partnership website under past events. And the program tonight is part of the Delaware River Greenway Partnership's Heritage Lecture Series. We're really excited to host uh, jo Joseph Graybus tonight with Owning the River, Water, Rights, and Boundaries. Joseph Gravis is a nationally credited land trust professional, 44-year veteran of the land title industry and member of the New Jersey Tidelands Resource Council. And he's here to discuss water rights and boundaries along the Delaware River Valley, beginning with the earliest deeds through the most recent conflicts and the inherent right of the sovereign to control lands now and formally flowed by the tide. Again, a very exciting program in front of us. And without further ado, I'll uh, introduce Joseph Gratis. Thanks, Joseph. Hello there. How are you all doing tonight? Uh, great to be here. I was excited when uh, the folks at the Delaware River Greenway Partnership reached out to me. Um, I do a lot of uh, lecturing and public speaking, but uh, I, I, I'm always interested in being able to come before uh, diverse groups, uh, people of differing interests. And uh, hopefully I have a little something to offer, uh, something that you can walk away with. I don't know what you're expecting out of this evening's program. It's, it's supposed to be about an hour long program, which quite frankly is a short program for me. I'm used to talking two or three hours on a variety of subjects. So I, I try to fit in as much information as I could uh, about a lot of different things. We're going to be moving around a bit. We're going to talk a little bit about history. We're going to be talking about land ownership. We're going to be talking about uh, uh, interesting stories uh, on the river and uh, things that might impact you uh, with regard to uh, owning property or living near the, near the water, whether it be fresh water or salt water. Um, and some of the things that impact folks every day, and the importance of our water system in New Jersey. Here's the good news. We have some of the cleanest water in all of the United States, and uh, that's really important. And those of us who are old enough to remember when you could basically walk across the uh, uh, the Hackensack and Passaic River uh, because it was uh, so polluted, um, know that the efforts that have been made in the last probably about 50 years uh, have, have really turned things uh, around. But even to this day, uh, we have uh, remnants of those issues that still uh, remain and, and, and therefore we have to be good stewards uh, of the land and of the water because they're interconnected. They, there's a, a symbiosis between the two um, and we can't take either one for granted. And so it's uh, organizations like the Delaware River Greenway Partnership uh, who are actively involved in that sort of uh, preservation and management and, and just concern. Uh, you know, it's real easy nowadays to become self-focused and think only about what's important to you. When's the next uh, paycheck or the next uh, uh, trip to Chick-fil-A or, or whatever it is you're doing or your next vacation. But uh, it's important to uh, think about the environment that you live in and uh, and uh, the people around you and 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 the, the world around you. I, I just got back from uh, Iceland, and I can tell you that uh, it was very different than here. And it's a very dramatic landscape. Uh, lots of rivers, lots of waterfalls, lots of water. Uh, just very, really breathtaking. 
But I do have to say one of the things that I loved coming back home was the trees. They have almost no trees there. And, and you realize how you take for granted, um, you know, a lot of nature uh, that's there every day and you walk by it. No, it's just another tree. It's just another river or brook or whatever. And, and you don't realize it. Uh, you don't look at it holistically and, and uh, going to a place like Iceland does that. It opens up your eyes where, where the, the, the geography and the geology is, is very much prevalent every day. And, and it is here too. We just have been so inured to it that we take it for granted. And so uh, I hope that you get out of this some appreciation, some deeper appreciation for the environment that we live in and, and how we got here. With that said, just uh, quickly, you know, myself, I, I spent a lot of time in the title industry. I was a title searcher, I was a title insurer, I owned a surveying company, uh, and, and I've been doing that for, it'll be 45 years uh, this, at the end of this year. And, um, you know, but I've also taken the time to get involved as a historical commissioner, and I, I sit on the Tidelands Resource Council. That was one of my interests in doing this program, because I am very much involved in the water uh, the water resources in New Jersey and, and the, the water ownership in New Jersey and regulation in New Jersey. And it's extensive. And that's one of the reasons why we have such clean water. And that and the fact that we have two of the largest uh, uh, aquifers in, um, in west, uh, I'm sorry, east of the Mississippi and the highlands and of course down in the pylons, some of the purest water in the United States. And uh, so it, it's important to get involved in, in that sort of thing. And I also spent about 25 years working with the Fish and Wildlife Service on places like Sapporta Meadows and the Great Swamp and the Walk Hill River Refuge, uh, saving the Walk Hill River that was dying from uh, over being overloaded by nitrates. And, and today it's a beautiful place if you have a chance to go up there. It's the only river in in New Jersey that runs from south to north and empties into the, into the uh, Hudson. So it's, it's really a beautiful place. So, uh, and then finally, I wrote a book. And if you like history and you like real estate, then uh, this is the book for you. And uh, we, I won a little award for it. So uh, that might, uh, might pique your interest. It's an easy read. Uh, it's a great holiday gift. Um, it's only $20. You can get it on Amazon, or you can uh, reach out to us directly, and I can send you a signed copy, uh, you know, for a nominal fee and, uh, you know, shipping and posting, that sort of thing. All right, so, uh, so let us know. Let's get started. William Blackstone, famous English jurist. In 1667, he sits down and he writes four massive volumes. And they're right here over my head, right, right up here, right next to my book. And it's all about English common law because they didn't have a statutory framework like we have. So he took all of English common law and tried to explain the legal concepts of English common law. And the crazy thing is, the interesting thing is, is that 60%, at least 60% of these four volumes are about property, about property ownership, land ownership, individual property ownership, personal property ownership, because in his words, there's nothing which so generally strikes the imagination and engages the affections of mankind as the right of property or that soul and despotic dominion which one man claims and exercises over the external things of the world in total exclusion of the right of any other individual in the universe. This is 1676 here, okay? He's saying in the universe. Um, and so he's way ahead of his time. And he understands the importance of um, what you call, you know what? And I, I am incorrect, I have to correct myself. Uh, this, this was uh, 17, 1776, I typed it wrong. I typed it in there just today. I wanted to put in the date. 
And I'm sitting there going, it wasn't 1676, it's 1776. I'm sorry, 1776. So to bring this more to home, I, I called upon John Steinbeck, who in The Grapes of Wrath wrote, if a man owns a little property, that property is him. It's part of him and it's like him. And if he owns property only so he can walk on it and handle it and be sad when it isn't doing well and feel fine when the rain falls on it, that property is him. And some way he's bigger because he owns it. Even if he isn't successful, he's big with his property. That is so. And so my thesis is that while, yes, many people came here to New Jersey and to the New World for to get away from religious persecution, uh, things of that nature, I feel that the overwhelming reason they came here was self-determination and the ownership of property is all about self-determination. The ability to own one's own place and bigger be bigger because of it. And that includes, of course, the waterways that go with it. And especially in the 17th and 18th century, in an agrarian society, water was immensely important, right? Irrigation, transportation, sustenance, uh, being able to run a mill, whether it be a sawmill or a grist mill, took water power. So we're talking about energy here. Water was super important to these early settlers who came, and quite frankly, New Jersey, we didn't come over from Europe, you know. We came from Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Long Island, those were the earliest, the first settlers in New Jersey. Why? Because we're not called the Garden State for nothing. In 1664, the Wild West started at the Jersey Shore. And we were going west from there. And New Jersey held great promise. It was a wonderful climate. It had uh, a great soil to grow things in. It, had, uh, it didn't have all the rocks of New England, and it didn't have the malaria of Virginia. New Jersey was the garden state. And so people came here because they wanted to own a piece of it. They wanted to be bigger because they owned a piece of it. And most of them initially settled where? Along the waterways. And so not only are the waterways important to us today, because of our watershed and uh, recreation, but because it's our heritage, right? It's, um, it, it's part of who we are and where we came from and the things that water allowed us to do. I don't know if you've ever been to, um, you know, an old village that has, still has a working mill, uh, like a grist mill or a sawmill, but it, it's pretty amazing to see it work. Uh, uh, if you've ever been down to Batstow, they've got a working sawmill down there that runs off of water power. And uh, it, it's ingenious how they could take this movement, this inertia, right, and turn it into something else, turning into boards that could then be used to build a house or a church or, or a, a schoolhouse and to grow a society that's built around those things not just subsist, uh, but, but, to, but to thrive, not just survive, but, th but to thrive, right? And of course, building uh, the culture and the, the heritage that we experience and enjoy today. So I want you to think deeply about the importance of property, ownership of property, control of property, uh, and, and that includes the waters that are on it, whether it's a mill pond or a stream, or an irrigation pond, or or uh, or a river, where you can set up a um, a transportation hub, and that's why we have places like Trenton, Easton, Phillipsburg, Philadelphia, 
Bordentown. These were all transportation hubs. Uh, why is Trenton where Trenton is? It's the head of navigation on the Delaware River. They continued going up until they couldn't go any further. They came to the falls of Trenton. Uh, yes, you could go on beyond that, but it would have to be in much smaller, uh, small, smaller vessels. Uh, and we're going to talk more about that at the end of this program. And I'll give you a little, a little story that I thought was interesting that I ran into through my research. Um, but let's take a look at, and let me see if I can do this. This is a, a map of New Jersey from 1777. And New Jersey is also unique. Why? Because at no place in New Jersey are you ever more than 40 miles away from the Delaware River, the Hudson River, or the Atlantic Ocean. Never more than 40 miles away. And of course, there are, um, which we call it uh, tributaries, in between areas. I'm, I'm going to see if I can uh, scroll in here a little bit. Let me see. I, I, yep, yep, I can do this. Yep. Not as much as I would like, but okay, that's fine. So as we can see, let's start at the bottom. When we look at the bottom of uh, the New Jersey, and, and I, I picked this map because, of course, it shows New Jersey long before it really got to be uh, developed. This is 1777. Yes, we we're a state at this point, but we're still pretty sparsely populated. But uh, but look at the various um, what you call tributaries that uh, that go up through here. And uh, I want you to look at the town of Greenwich, uh, 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 Greenwich. I'm sorry, that's how they pronounce it. I went down there to do a, a talk. It's not Greenwich. It's Greenwich. And they're on the Maurice River. It's spelled M-A-U-R-I-C-E, but they pronounce it Morris River. So everywhere you go, there's a different way of speaking, even in New Jersey. But there was a there was a tea party in Green uh, Greenwich, just as there was in Boston. A lot of people don't know that. Go into Greenwich. There's a plaque there, and there were rebels, uh, quote unquote, at the time who who uh, came down to the docks because this was a major transportation center. And they dumped the tea that was on these boats into uh, the Morris River. So you could see where, as we go through, we see all the various tributaries. It's not that hard to get around. It was one of the reasons why all of the early Lenape settlements were on the Delaware. They were all in the Delaware. There was Crosswicks. And uh, there was a Cohansee, and then up top here, uh, up by Port Jervis, there was Minisink. And the early Lenape would travel east to the Hudson River and down the Jersey Shore uh, in the summertime. And they would use these tributaries in uh, you know, small canoe type boats. And of course, coming down the Delaware, up and down the Delaware. This, the Delaware River linked these three Lenape uh, uh, settlements. There were, these were major settlements. They were winter settlements. And uh, all along the, uh, the Delaware, because, of course, it was safer than being out on the coast, especially in the winter. And it was much easier to, uh, to navigate. But as you can see, uh, we have quite a few tributaries that run off of these three major waterways uh, that were very important to the development of New Jersey as a, as a state. Let me see if I can get back out of this. Okay, so let's start at the beginning because that's always the best place to start. And it's not really the beginning, but it's the beginning of the most important real estate transaction in New Jersey history. The beginning, of course, was 12,000 years ago when the Lenape first came to New Jersey, but we don't have any deeds from that time. And then after that, there was the Dutch in 1631, but most of those deeds are in Albany and they're in Dutch and nobody can read them except for one guy uh, uh, who wrote a book about it, by the way. Um, but in 1664, the English show up and say, New Jersey belongs to us. 
And they do that because in March of 1664, Charles II gives all of the land between the Connecticut River and the Delaware River to his brother, James the Duke of York. James is this uh, snappy dressing guy up here in the, uh, in the outfit fit with the cape. Uh, I have an outfit just like this, only it's in blue. That's my color. Um, but, uh, and I used to have hair like that too, but, but unfortunately that's gone. But what's important is to look over his right shoulder. And that is the English fleet. And uh, James the Duke of York was the Lord Admiral of the Ocean Seas, as named by his brother. James would later become king himself, but he was, he was driven out by his daughter and, and William of Orange. But that's not what we're talking about today. He goes and gives all that land to James. Charles gives it to James. James, three months later, turns around to these two guys, Lord Berkeley and James Carteret, and gives them this document. This document still exists to this day. It's down in the uh, New Jersey archives. It is the Duke's grant. And this is the first document that says the name New Jersey. This is the birth certificate of New Jersey. Why is this important? Because it defines what New Jersey is, but not only does it define New Jersey, it vests title in New Jersey and describes what New Jersey is. And that's gonna come into play. This document is gonna come into play in 2007 in the Supreme Court of New Jersey. Believe it or not, they're gonna dig this baby up and it's gonna be very important to a case that's gonna happen 300 years later. And that's why we have deeds and that's why we record documents because they are there 200, 300, 1,000 years from now, these documents will still be there so that we can base our claims to ownership, that thing that makes us feel bigger based upon these documents. Because every deed is built upon the deed before and the deed before that and deed before that. And this deed here is the predecessor to every one of your deeds. Any one of you out here, there, who own a piece of property, this is your first deed. This is the first deed in your chain of title. It all started right here. So the Duke's grant in June of 1664, we're gonna do these a little backward for a purpose. It says that it's all this property bounded on the east in part by the main sea, in other words, the Atlantic Ocean, and part by Hudson's River and half upon the west, Delaware Bay or River. So that's our other side. And it says it goes as far as the northernmost branch of the Bay or River of Delaware. So the Delaware is very important here. It not only determines our westerly boundary, but it determines our northerly boundary, sort of. And says, which is 41 degrees, 40 minutes latitude. I want you to remember those numbers, 41, 40, 41, 40, 41, 40. And to the Hudson River at 41 degrees of latitude, okay? Which said tract of land is hereafter to be called by the name or names of New Caesarea or New Jersey? Caesar is Jersey. Jersey is the anglicization of the word Caesar. It's called New Jersey because there's an island off the coast of France, which is owned by England, called the Isle of Jersey. And George Carteret was the governor of that island. And because he and Berkeley stayed true to Charles II after his father got his head cut off and Cromwell came and took over, he went in exile on the Isle of Jersey. So when he gave this property to Berkeley and Carteret, they called it New Jersey. And it also went on to say, and also all the rivers. Now, here's the problem with that. We're talking about Delaware. We're talking about the ocean. We're talking about the Hudson River, right? 
And then he says, and also rivers, you think, well, then that means the Delaware River also. Actually, it doesn't, because when we go back to the King's Grant from March, that gave it to uh, James the Duke of York, his brother, it describes the land between the two rivers by the names of Connecticut and Hudson, together also with said river called Hudson's River. So it gives them title to Hudson River. He gave that to James the Duke of York. And all the land from the west side of the Connecticut River to the east side of the Delaware Bay. In other words, they didn't get title to any of the Delaware. And we see in the former deed, it was bounded on the east part by the main sea and the Hudson River. So we didn't get title to any part of the Hudson River or the Atlantic Ocean either. All we got was the peninsula in between. That's all the Berkeley and Carteret got was the peninsula in between. Now, the problem is that in, as I told you, in 1664, the Wild West starts at the Jersey Shore. Nobody had been in the interior uh, to any great degree. We know that because we look at this map created by Nicholas Vischer, who was a Dutch cartographer, one of the most famous Dutch cartographers at the time. And he drew this map and it was called Novi Belgium or New Belgium. Okay, and uh, new, also New Netherlands. You can see New, 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 uh, new York. Um, and it doesn't say New Jersey on here anywhere because New Jersey doesn't exist yet. And he draws this really cool map. It's a cool map when you look at it. And it's pretty close out here on the coast for New Jersey, right? It looks pretty, you know, all the barrier island and everything and down here, Cape May, even says Cape May because by then, uh, Cornelius May had already come to Cape May. He was here in the early 1600s, uh, right after Hudson showed up. But Nicholas Vischer never came to, the, uh, to, to America. He didn't see any of this stuff. And he drew it all based upon writings that other people made. Not surveys, not compass courses and distances and boundaries. That's why when we look over here, this is Delaware. Does this green part look anything like Delaware? No, of course it doesn't. It's not that big. The Delmarva Peninsula is not that big. But that's because he was never, he knew there was a Chesapeake Bay because John Smith had already come through and plotted all that. If you ever go down to Jamestown, look for the interactive John Smith map. It's really cool. And it's amazingly exact. John Smith went out in a boat with like 10 guys, a boat they call a shallop, which is an open boat. He went all the way up the Chesapeake and he plotted and surveyed the whole thing. And it's incredibly almost identical to uh, what it is today. But he didn't survey the interior. And of course, Nicholas Vischer never came here. So he never uh, surveyed the interior here either. So I wanna, I wanna zoom in for a second to New Jersey and we can see here's New Jersey. It's pretty obvious, right? And, uh, but what does he do with Delaware? He comes up here. Delaware hangs a hard left. So this is going to be somewhere around Trenton. This is somewhere down here around Philadelphia, around Bordentown. Hangs a left at Trenton. And then the Delaware splits into two separate rivers, which come back together up in New York and dump into the Hudson. Well, we all know that doesn't, that doesn't happen. That doesn't exist. That's not correct. The Delaware doesn't connect with the uh, Hudson. And the forks of the Delaware are way up further in New York. And you can see here, there's a lot of detail along the river, right? Because yeah, that's where people settle. Here's Philadelphia right here. Here's Trenton up here. Hasn't even been settled yet. But as we go up here, we go further in, it's anybody's guess. Well, James the Duke of York used this map to decide the boundaries of New Jersey. 
So if, if we go back to what they said, they said, the Duke's grant said, as far north as the northernmost branch of the bay or river. And then when we go ahead, we say, well, the northernmost branch, where is that on this map? Could be up here, could be here. I don't think it's here, but New York tried to say it was, and that's another story. But let's look at it today, all right? So today, this is the northern boundary of New Jersey, ends at Port Jervis. This is where the Delaware goes left and uh, a much smaller uh, uh, river goes to the right. It starts with an M, I can't pronounce it, but, uh, but where it splits is way up here in Han Han Hancock, New York. That's where the next split in the Delaware is, the Eastern branch and the, and the Western branch of the Delaware. And so when we look back at our 4140, we're looking here, Port Jervis is only 4135. Now the point on Hudson is 41, or 40.99. So he's pretty close on that because they had been there, but nobody had been out to Port Jervis yet. Port Jervis didn't exist. Then we look at 4140. It's just kind of just north a little bit of Port Jervis. Still not the same place where the, the fork was. We see a fork here. It could be that spot, but it's not. So what happens because of this? Well, New York and New Jersey fight a 50-year border war. I don't know how many of you are familiar with that. It was something very much like the Hatfields and the McCoys. Only in this case, it was the Swartouts and the Deckers. Most of these people up here were of Dutch descent. And uh, they would beat each other up. They would uh, burn each other's crops. They would, uh, this guy uh, swore out, they came into uh, church one day on a Sunday and kidnapped him, beat him up and took him back to New Jersey. He was in, uh, in New York and held him for a period of time. This was not unusual. People thought of their, their colonies and later states as their country. And so there were, there were fights between um, uh, Connecticut and uh, Pennsylvania it was called the Yankee Pennamite War. There was a, a, a war between Pennsylvania and Maryland. It was called the Cresap War. There were wars between North Carolina and South Carolina. This was not unusual at the time. Why? Because land was really important. Land and access to the water that traversed that land. And so this argument went on. And as you can see from this graphic, all these different lines were claimed. At one point, New York claimed all the way down here in the green line, and New Jersey claimed all the way up here on the purple line. And in the end, it wasn't until 1769 that the king had to settle this at the red line, and that is today's line. So now let's see how this affected the Delaware going south. And I call this how to get from New Jersey to Delaware without getting your feet wet. And what you're looking at on your left is not so much the, the uh, uh, cemetery, but the church steeple, because Legend has it that this church steeple was very important in this next story. So let's go down and look at what we got here. We got New Jersey on the right. We got Delaware on the left. And of course, right through the middle of it, we've got the Delaware River. And so we're thinking to ourselves, okay, New Jersey, you're on the right-hand side. Delaware, you're on the left-hand side. And then we just split the difference right down the middle of the river, which is the usual way it's done. Most times, there was a guy named Hugo Grotius. 
He was a famous Dutch uh, a lawmaker, and he established some of the earliest law involving property and equity uh, and war, by the way. And so he came up with what they call the Groschen method, which is splitting the waterways, any waterway, whether it's the Delaware River or whether it's a creek or stream. And so when we get property boundaries, often we'll see a description that says running to the middle of the stream and then upset stream so many feet to another point. Um, and it always runs to the middle. Now, the deal with that is as the river meanders and changes, the boundary line moves with it because it always ties to the middle of the stream. So everyone has an equal share of the stream. Uh, what you call it, one of the things that the Western proprietors did was unlike the Dutch who would allow you to buy on both sides of a stream uh, or river, they would not allow you to do that. You could only buy on one side of the river so that other people would have the opportunity for access to the water. And that was one of the requirements early on when the West Jersey proprietors started meeting out uh, land. So you would think it would go right down the middle here, right? Well, you couldn't be more wrong. So what happens is, uh, what you call it? Let's talk about Pennsylvania first, because that's give us a little background. Uh, and that, that'll bring us to Delaware. So the boundary between New Jersey and Pennsylvania, that was settled by agreement in 1783. We know that, that New Jersey didn't get any part of the river because it wasn't in their deed. But New Jersey and Pennsylvania get together in 1783 and says, listen, uh, the entire length of the river will remain a common highway. Remember I was talking to you about transportation before? Rivers were highways. That was our transportation system long before the early roads were built. The earliest roads were the, the, uh, the Indian paths, the Native American paths that traversed uh, the state, not big enough to carry uh, wagons. This is an important thing to remember, and I think a lot of people don't understand it. Until Europeans came to New Jersey, the early Lenape did not have the wheel, they did not have horses, and they did not have iron. They were, for all intents and purposes, up until they were exposed to Europeans, living in the Stone Age. So they either had to walk everywhere they had to go or take a canoe or some type of boat along the waterway. So these waterways were those highways and they were to remain equally free and open for use for the water itself. Each state shall enjoy and exercise a concurrent jurisdiction within and upon the water and not the dry land. So that means if you were messing around out in a boat in the middle of the Delaware, it wouldn't matter whether it was uh, 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 New Jersey or uh, Pennsylvania pulled up to you. Uh, if you were doing something wrong, they could both enforce their jurisdiction out there. And that all the islands from Trenton North considered as part and parcel of the state to which insulated dry doth lie nearest so in other words, whatever islands are closest to the mainland, that's who got them. So if this one's close to New Jersey, that's a New Jersey island. That one's closer to uh, Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania got them. From the falls of Trenton South, they specifically named the island. It says this island is New Jersey's island. This island is Pennsylvania's island. They had a long list. Any other islands? belong to the nearest main state, mainland state, as long as if they weren't named in the agreement. They come along in 1786 and they named 75 islands north of Trenton. And of course, these islands are the ones that we're talking about that fall within the Delaware uh, Greenway, okay? That runs basically from Trenton up to Easton. And they're specifically named and allocated. Once again, those that aren't allocated are uh, under the jurisdiction of the nearest, um, what you call it, the nearest state. Subsequent court, court decisions after that 
held that the boundary north of Trenton used the Groshen method right down the middle, but south of Trenton, because that's the navigable part, the boundary was the Thalweg method along the channel so that everyone would have the use of channel. In other words, the channel wouldn't be in New Jersey water or Pennsylvania water. It would be available to everybody. There'd be a line right down the middle so that you could easily navigate up and down the navigable portion of the river. And that was decided in, uh, in 1783 and 86. When we look at a current map, there's a Google map. This is below the falls. You can see here's Philadelphia Airport and Gibbstown. Uh, this is the Thalweg method. That's why it comes down, looks generally down the center, but over here, it goes way over this way. Having been on the river at this point in my small boat, I can tell you that all the bigger boats go around to the right under the Commodore Baron because this is too low in here. There's no channel in this area. In fact, it's, it's pretty, uh, pretty silty and, uh, and, and you, you wouldn't be able to get there through there with a, a, a big boat. When we go north of the falls, and this is uh, up near um, Regal's, uh, Regalsville, uh, which is within the, the Delaware Greenway, uh, it is the Groshen method, straight down the middle, straight down the middle. Now this, this island here was undoubtedly given to uh, Pennsylvania in the 1786 agreement because it's closer, makes sense, right? So here we are again, back at Delaware on this side and Pennsylvania on this side. And did you ever wonder why the top of Delaware is round? It doesn't go along a river. Most, most uh, boundaries are usually along some natural barrier uh, along a river or something of that nature. Why does it go, why does it make a circle or a, a, a half circle or a portion of a circle, an arc? Well, that's because William Penn in 1682 took title to 12 mile radius around Newcastle, which was part of, well, it wasn't part of Pennsylvania then, Penn was, Penn was buying it for the first time. And so he bought this 12 mile circle. The problem was that the, from the Duke of York, by the way, same guy, Problem is, even the Duke of York, who was the Admiral of the Ocean Seas, couldn't sell the same property twice. You can sell the Brooklyn, Brooklyn Bridge twice, but you can't sell the same property twice. So in fact, what he sold was all of this circle minus what had already been sold to Berkeley and Carteret. And that's why there's a circle on the top of Delaware. Now, the problem is that over the years, they have dredged the uh, river and they've dumped the sand on the New Jersey side of the river. And so we see that this little portion right here and this little portion down the bottom here are actually in the state of Delaware. You can go down to this wildlife refuge or you can go down to Fort Mott State Park and you can walk from New Jersey onto Delaware without getting your feet wet. Why is this important? Well, years later in 1934 and again in 36, New Jersey said, we should own this. We should own all this. And we should have the, 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 the um, which call we should own out to the Thalweg, just like we do with uh, Pennsylvania. And it went all the way up to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court said, no, there's this deed in 1664 and earlier, and uh, the two deeds in 1664 that says, you don't own anything beyond the shoreline. Your property is bounded by the river. 
So you don't own that. So the fact that they dumped this uh, dredging on your side of the river, quote unquote, doesn't mean it magically becomes your property. And the Supreme Court says, that's decided. They came back in 35 or 36 and pressed the issue again. And the uh, US Supreme Court once again said, no, we told you last time, nothing has changed. Oh, and by the way, don't ever come here again. Don't ever come back. We don't want to see you. And this was the description in the 1682 deed. It says a compass circle of 12 miles uh, being upon the river Delaware and all islands in the river and the river and the soil there on the other. In other words, the soil underneath. So when we look back at a 1906 map, this dredging hasn't been done yet. Okay, so, and, and, and down here or up here. So it's not an issue, but it does become an issue later on. And you can see here, here's all the New Jersey fill. This is a, 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 a what you call an industrial op operation down here. And uh, it's in Delaware. It's Delaware uh, regulates it. It's not in New Jersey. So what happens in 2007? 2007, they want to put in a liquid natural gas depot on the river. I'll, I'll show you exactly where it is. It's like right here, right, right here, right up in this little corner. We'll put a liquid, liquid, liquid national ga gas thing here. And so they go to New Jersey and they come to the Tidelands Commission actually and ask for a grant so that they can go out into the water, put in docks and stuff like that. And this, you know, the state goes to do that and Delaware steps up and said, you can't do that. We own that water. And so it goes to court. And in the case of two states who are suing each other, it goes immediately to the Supreme Court. That's required under our system of justice. Uh, it doesn't have to go through, it doesn't go to state court, of course, because that would be prejudicial. And it skips over the, uh, the usual uh, federal district court, uh, because once again, those federal district courts are located in, uh, in either Philadelphia or Newark. So instead, it goes right to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court says, we told you back in 36 what we thought, and you didn't listen. They appointed a special master, they did all the work all over again. And they came up with the same conclusion that even though you're gonna have to drive across New Jersey to get to this dock, this facility, it's not in New Jersey. And the justices voted six to two that it was in Delaware. And there were two justices that voted no. And guess who they were? The two justices from the state of New Jersey. <laughs> so they were, that's, you, you see why they don't go to local jurisdictions, because here you go all the way to the Supreme Court, and the two Jersey justices vote for New Jersey. Uh, so there was still a conflict there, right? The point is, this was a 300 and some odd year old document, and it was still as important today with regard to the waterway as it was 300 and some odd years ago. And so that's why property ownership is so important. That's why these deeds are so important because they are our history and our heritage. So let's talk a little bit about water rights because I see I'm running down on time here. Let's try to move through this pretty quickly. Water rights, every single drop of water in New Jersey is regulated by the state of New Jersey and other people. Drainage, navigation, flooding, wetlands, tidelands, consumption, all of it. These are all your laws, federal jurisdiction, state jurisdiction, Wetlands Act of 1970, the Clean Water Act of 77, the Pine Land Protection Act, the Hackensack Meadowlands Reclamation Act, 
Highlands Water Protection Act, uh, Wild and scenic, River, scenic Rivers Act, Management Areas, Acquisitions, Natural Areas System Act, all of this stuff. And because of that, because of that, New Jersey's law is generally stronger than the federal law. By and large, New Jersey's laws are among the strictest in the country. Our testing is more rigorous than the federal government's. However, it is a myth that your water can be perfectly safe. We saw that in Newark, right? But it wasn't the source that was the problem. It was the infrastructure that was the problem in that case. The piping was old and, uh, and, and tainted. That brings us to our Tidelands discussion. This is about ownership. I sit on the Tidelands Council, Tidelands Resource Council. I'm one of a bunch of people who sits and hears applications by the citizens of New Jersey to acquire or to use water in the state of New Jersey, okay, waterways, and specifically those that have been now or formerly flowed by tidal water. I have to do this disclaimer, though, because I'm speaking for myself and not for the state of New Jersey and not for the Tidelands Resource Council. So, in 1967, the state of New Jersey, they claimed that they owned all lands now or formerly flowed by the tide. Not just currently, but any time in the past. And that went to New Jersey Supreme Court. And under the case of O'Neill versus State Highway Department 67, the Supreme Court agreed. So that means now, that anyone who owned property where there used to be a stream where the tide flowed, they didn't own that property. And so here's a picture of a Tidelands map, which is a photograph with an overlay. And this yellow area here is claimed by the state of New Jersey. This guy in red, this chunk of his property is claimed by the state of New Jersey he's going to have to buy it from the state of New Jersey. This was from a map from 1880. So in 1880, this stream was there. It may not have been there for the last 100 years, doesn't matter. The state wants to be paid. In fact, the state uses maps that goes all the way back to 1851. So if the land under your house in 1851 was flowed by tidal waters, the state may claim ownership to it today. There's a lot more information online. If you were interested in this stuff, we issue grants, which is actual ownership, licenses, which is like a, 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 like a, a theater ticket. You get to use it for a while. Statements of no interest, which means we have no interest in the property. Leases, which is like, like a, a house lease or something like that. Um, these are all tabs you can click on and, and learn more. This is the Tidelands map coverage. The good news is most of the Delaware River Greenway is not in a Tidelands claimed zone. That would be this area right, right in here, okay? It's not in, actually, it's up, all the way up to here. It's not in a Tidelands claim zone. So that's a good thing. And in these four counties, there's no Tidelands claims whatsoever. This is a claim of ownership. It's not a claim of regulation. They regulate the water all the way up the Delaware, but they only own the water, or what was formerly flowed, up until just, just around Trenton, actually. Now, what does this mean for you? Here's people here who put in a new bulkhead and didn't get a grant. It's the same as putting your fence five feet onto your neighbor's property. These folks had to pay $26,000 to the state. These people did the same thing. This little, what we call a bulkhead bump out. They had to pay $20,000 to the state, but it gets worse. These people here, this ran right through the middle of their property. I think it's in Avalon, very pricey area. The state wants them to pay $1,091,738 to buy property that they thought they owned. These people here, almost their entire property 
was claimed by the state tidelands. They won, it was originally assessed at 1,612,993. There are certain discounts available and they, were, and they only had to pay $420,375. You say to yourself, oh my gosh, that's a lot of money. I am not the one who decides how much is paid for these. Myself and the other people who are unpaid, who sit on the council, we act as a quasi-judicial body that listens to the applicant and listens to the state. Each one makes their case, and then we make a decision as to whether we're going to lease, license, or grant uh, property that the New Jersey Supreme Court says is owned by the state of New Jersey. It doesn't matter how long you've lived there. I'm telling you this because New Jersey is one of the very few states in the country that does this. Most other states do not claim formerly flowed tidal waters, only currently flowed tidal waters. Now, here's another claim map. You can see most of this is, is uh, in a Meadowlands area. Um, it's claimed, but this is what happens. It erodes away. That was 1977. This is 2002. When the land erodes away, you lose title. The people who own this land before, they just lose it, and now it's owned by the state. It's similar to when you own land on a fresh water, fresh, fresh waterway when the river moves. If the river moves because of the natural flow of the water, not by somebody damming it up or something like that, making a canal, the, the tidal moves with it, okay? That's called erosion and accretion. Well, anybody who's been down to Wildwood has ever had to walk 500 miles through burning sand to get there knows that when the uh, land comes back, it's called accretion. And now you get that land because the land came back, only as long as it's natural and imperceptible. If the Army Corps of Engineers comes in and, and redump stand there, you don't get title to that. There is a, uh, online, there is a, um, and you could, you could do like a print screen of this if you wanted to. There is a slideshow that you can go and look at and learn more about the Bureau of Tidelands Management. Um, and some of the particulars. Like I said, I do a three hour program just on Tidelands. But I wanted to give you some sense of that. But now I want to end up and bring you back to the Greenway, to the Delaware Greenway. I recently was doing some work in Stockton, okay, which is the original home of the Greenway partnership and um, within the Greenway. And um, I ran across this guy, Richard Holcomb. And Holcomb is a big family name in and around Stockton. If anybody knows the Stockton area, they know that. And, uh, and I was really surprised to find out, I was doing his genealogy. Actually, I was doing his father Thomas's genealogy. And uh, I do a lot of that for the work that I do. And I found something really interesting. I found out that Richard Holcomb, Alfred Thomas, and Judge William Sharp entered into business together in the Kinetiti Improvement Company. And one of the things they wanted to do was open up travel, steamboat travel, between Easton and Matamoros. Matamoros is up by Port Jervis. It's right across the river from, from Port Jervis. And a lot of people said, you can't do it. The river's too low. You're going to have problems. Uh, and they said, no, we're going to do it. And they built this steamboat, 87 feet long, but only 15 feet wide. This is very small, all right? Small and thin. It was powered by two 15 horsepower steam engines, which doesn't seem like much. Uh, I got a boat, I got a 252 horsepower, uh, and that's only 22 feet by nine feet. Um, how are they going to push this thing up the Delaware River with 
two 15 horsepower steam engines. So I'm going to tell you how. They build this thing. They're all ready to go. They think it's great. And it's a big day. It's the 150th anniversary of, of, uh, of, of Northampton County, which is where Easton is. And uh, which called, they said, let's do it. So 100 men and boys get on the, um, which called the, uh, the Alpha Thomas uh, at the end of the canal. There's a canal here. It's in Williamsport, just below uh, Easton. And they get in and they're all excited. There's bands, they're playing, they're jumping up and down, they're screaming and yelling and shooting off guns and things like that. It's great. And they take it to the bottom of Northampton Street where the vast majority of the people get off. It's all oh, that was fun, that was great. And they're all gonna go you know, get a beer or something at the local hotel. But of course the boat is heading for Matamoros. And so with 34 people left on board, they head on up the Delaware River, but they don't get very far. They get to Getter's Island. And here's a picture of the Alpha Thomas run aground at, uh, what you call it, at Getter's Island. They didn't get very far, did they? And here they are trying to back and pull it off of the uh, 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 of being running ground. So now, you know, the engine's working real hard, right? There's a paddle wheel on the back. It's working very, they got both of those engines kicking all 30 horsepower of them, right? And we come back to the site and they can't get off. And all of a sudden, boom, the Alfred Thomas explodes. There's wood and parts and metal and people thrown all over the place. And this is what it looked like on that day. Middle of the day, all these people watching and the Alpha Thomas explodes. Now, the interesting is, is the boat builder, Thomas Bishop, the guy who actually built the boat, he wouldn't even get on board the boat when it was ready to go. He said, I'm not getting on that boat because he felt that the chief engineer had improperly installed those steam boilers. He wouldn't even get on the boat. And when it pulled out, he turned his back on the boat. 12 of the 34 people who were on board died in the explosion, including Judge William Sharp, his 17 year old son, the engineer Schaff, the only way thing they found of him was his uniform and Stockton's own Richard Holcomb. And I found this in Thomas Holcomb's will, the mention of the fact that his son has predeceased him. And I said, how could he have died? And as I did more research, I found out this horrible story about the explosion. And nobody ever again attempted to go north of the Delaware Greenway on a steam-powered device. I wanted to tell you this story, not because I, it, it's gruesome or horrible, which it, it is, right? But I wanted you to understand the aspirations of the people who lived along the Greenway, the folks who wanted to endeavor to greater things and to expand and develop the country. Uh, you know, Madame Morris and Port Jervis, you know, in 1860, they, they, were, they were pretty far away, right? If they could get there by water, well, how much better would that have been? And how much business could they have brought to Easton and further down the Greenway? All of the, um, all of the, 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 the people that lived along the Greenway, the millers and the, and the carpenters and the, um, you know, the, the tradespeople and the farmers, they could move their product up the river and down the river 
And this was the vision that these three men had. Unfortunately, uh, their quality control was not the best, right? And, um, and so they had to learn the hard way. But the river itself held the promise of, of this dream. And so they went and they tried to exploit it. And for every one of these stories, there's thousands of great okay. success stories along the Greenway. And so it's not just important to preserve it for environmental purposes, which is first and foremost, for recreation purposes. But most importantly for me, being a historian, it's the heritage of the Greenway, what it meant to generations of people, hundreds of years of, of residents and people that were born here. And many of the uh, Holcombs moved west from here to even greater dreams. But they were all born, those dreams were all born along the Greenway. And being an individual who spent a lot of my time taking my kids uh, up to Frenchtown and jumping in with our tubes and going all the way down to, to Stockton and to, to the trestle and all, uh, the Greenway holds uh, an area near and dear to my heart. And um, I hope that the folks at the partnership continue to do their work and that you support them. And at this point, I will open it up for any questions that you might have. Thank you so much, Mr. Gravis. What an incredible program. I had never heard the story about the liquefied natural gas terminal and land ownership dispute. I'm sure that costs some folks a lot of money. Um, but anyway, I was just absolutely thrilled uh, to hear uh, your program this evening. And um, we did have one question I wanted to throw your way and I'd encourage any of our participants to enter any additional questions they have either in the Q&A or in the chat. We'll take any written questions first. Uh, and then if anybody chooses to raise their hand, uh, we'll, we'll let them raise their question verbally once we're done with the written questions. So take a moment and throw any questions you might have in the chat. The question we did receive already was in reference to the erosion. You showed a few maps, both where the shoreline had receded naturally, and then also maps where man-made incursions um, with the bulkheads were, were built. I think the question is specific to the erosion. And the person asked if the title insurance covers any of those claims. Could you speak to that? Sure, sure. So, uh, I mean, that's an excellent question, by the way. So title insurance has covered and still covers many of these claims. Uh, I would say out of the 30 applications we hear every month before the council, uh, a third of them are probably um, uh, title claims that are being paid by title insurers. And the reason for that is, is that these claims are based upon maps and the maps were created from 1973 to 1982. During that time, the title companies did not necessarily have access to those maps until they were finally filed. Even once they were filed, the title insurance industry didn't have the ability to actually read them or understand them. It wasn't until, believe it or not, 2008, when the title insurance industry finally said, we've had enough of this, we will order Tideland searches, there are private companies that do Tideland searches, people who are experienced and experts in the field of reading Tideland's maps, and uh, which we call it, um, they provide us with a search. We do that on every single property, even if you're nowhere near the water. If you're in the middle of the Tidelands, we will still do a, um, which we call it, uh, a Tideland search. Uh, on, on that property. So now we reveal them. So what happens is when we reveal them, when you're going to sell your property um, or buy a property, everybody will know about it. The seller 
can hopefully turn back to his title insurance, his or her title insurance company, and say, hey, I have a claim here. And so they will uh, come in and defend that claim. On the other hand, if they knew about it and they set up a, an exception to it, that it wouldn't be covered. So whenever you buy property, especially if it's near the water, but even if it's not, you're always going to want to look at the Tideland search because the Tideland search is going to tell you whether or not there is a claim by the state. And then your title company will tell you whether or not they cover it. All right. Um, as far as the accretion and erosion is concerned, um, that's a little trickier because you, it, the, 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 the onus is upon the pro adjoining property owner to prove that it was actually erosion or prove that it was actually accretion. It's not the state's responsibility. I know that doesn't seem necessarily right, but that's the way it is. So. Um, that was a great question. Thanks, Joe. We've so, got some comments in the chat. I'm sorry, did I catch yeah, you? Yeah, I'm, I'm reading them here in front of me, so I'll, I'll just jump on this. Then. How far can docks extend into the Delaware River? Who regulates this? It's a problem in Bucks County along the Delaware. So um, each side of the river, of course, is, um, is regulated by, you know, either Pennsylvania or the state by their Department of Environmental Protection. And so docks in New Jersey, if we haven't, if the state doesn't own the land, they still regulate how far you can put them. And the general rule in New Jersey, and I can't speak to Pennsylvania, but the general rule in New Jersey is that you must have four feet of water under your boat at low tide. So you would have to put a dock out as far as it needs to go to get to that point, four feet at low tide. However, you might have to, it might be so low that you have to, um, uh, that you're out into navigation and they won't allow that. So then you'd have to apply for a dredging permit to dredge out a channel to get to your dock, okay? Um, once again, that all goes to the DEP, and it's, it's a very involved process. It's not so much expensive in permitting, but it takes a long time, and you're probably going to have to hire uh, engineers or environmental uh, people in order to, to make that application. Um, so who owns the uh, Delaware Raritan and Canal flowage under parts of Trenton? So that's part of the... Uh, which call it of the um, uh, watershed system. It was uh, purchased by uh, from the Delaware Route and Canal years ago. Uh, originally, uh, the Delaware Canal and the Morris Canal uh, were bought up by um, railroads uh, because it was cheaper to buy the railroad, uh, to buy the, the uh, canal way than it was uh, to buy the canal. The canals are interesting in New Jersey. And there's a lot of history about them. Uh, canals were just getting going around 1831 when railroads started getting going and railroads pretty quickly eclipsed the canals. They were relatively short-lived in uh, New Jersey, but they did use the canal paths where the mules walked to put their uh, railroads on afterwards. So um, much of the, not every inch of it, but much of the Delaware Raritan Canal is owned by the state of New Jersey today, uh, you know, in, in one form or another, uh, and is used as part of the, the watershed to move water and drainage and things of that nature. Um, are there any operating water powered mills in the Greenway? I can't answer that question. Uh, you know, maybe Mark can. Um, uh, and it says, do, uh, or elsewhere in New Jersey, like I said, in, um, in Batstow, there's a sawmill that is water powered and operates. I think, I may be wrong, but I think Pearl's Mills uh, still, um, still runs or can run if they divert the water through the, the raceway mill. But I, don't, I haven't been there many years, so uh, don't, don't quote me on that. 
Um, do mill properties still retain rights to the waterways? That's an excellent question also. Um, yes, we would have to look at the deed. It says, I've heard of mill deeds claiming ownership to the stream that powered it. Absolutely. So you, it all goes back to the deeds and you can actually get a deed for the, uh, for the, the waterway. But what you get a deed for is actually the land underneath the waterway or what they call the, the, the mill race. You're not getting a deed for the water necessarily. You can get rights to use the water. There's a very famous case called Jefferson v. Davis, where, uh, where a mill owner thought that he bought the lake, but he didn't. He just bought the rights to use the water from the lake to come down through his mill race. Um, so you'd have to look at the deed. Do you have comments on the Morris Canal breakup and sale of said land? You know, I'm not, um, I'm not an expert on the Morris Canal. I have read uh, about it. I know that uh, my old uh, professor, Dr. Veit, his father wrote a, uh, a book uh, about the Morris Canal and there have been other uh, uh, things written about it. Um, you know, I think it's, it's like anything, uh, the Morris Canal, uh, especially when it comes near uh, Hunt, uh, Jersey City and areas like that, obviously development over the years has, has gobbled up a bunch of the Morris Canal and the railroads have gobbled a bunch of it up too. Um, so, I mean, it, it is a shame to see, especially the locks uh, disappear, uh, the incline planes, that sort of thing. Uh, and, and hopefully there's people out there, preservationists, uh, who are trying to not preserve it physically, uh, preserve the memory of it. Um, and I see one here says, I understand DEP forbids use of water power still. Well, last time I was in Batstow, um, they were they kicked it on and ran the, uh, uh, the sawmill. Now that was probably 15 or 20 years ago. So I don't know what's happened. I haven't been down to Bastow in some time, but I know the mill's still there. I don't know if it's, if it's specifically operating, okay? So that's a good question. Was the steamship salvaged in any part? Did one of the engines survive? Do any museums have information or artifacts of the ill-fated steamship? So if you want, you can uh, certainly Google it. There's a nice article written about it uh, uh, by an individual. And there was an old article in the uh, Scientific America uh, back at the time that it happened in 1860. Uh, I am not familiar with uh, if any of it was in fact salvage or, or the engine survived. I would think, quite frankly, considering the fact that it was a relatively shallow area, that salvage would have been relatively simple and, uh, and they would have uh, salvaged uh, any parts that would have been useful. Um, I, I don't know if there's anything still underwater there, but uh, I'm sure that if you uh, reach out to, uh, I'm sure Eastman, Eastman has a historical society and they probably have some information on it. Um, and so somebody said the mill in Chester Morris County still operates on occasion. So there you go. Um, and that looks like that's it. So thank you so much, Mark. It was great uh, working with you here. And uh, I hope you all got a little something out of this. And I appreciate you asking me to come in and, and share. We did have one last question, if you'll take it. Sure. If in the chat, somebody asked about, it sounds like primarily second home buyers along the Jersey Shore and the Delaware Bay Shore that may purchase a property that may then get hit with erosion. Uh, the, the question is if they have any recourse, the landowner has any recourse upon that act of nature. Yeah, so unfortunately, you know, their uh, due diligence is the, is, is the exact term. Um, you know, when you're buying real property, you always have to do due diligence. Uh, there is a risk in buying property and buying any property. And it's probably one of the biggest investments that anyone is ever going to make. Most people are going to make is, is buying a home or, or real property. Um, 
you know, the, I had a, a buddy of mine who wanted to buy a piece of property down in Cape May. And so I helped him with his due diligence. We did a flood search. We did a wetland search. We did a tideland search. And what I found was that although he was not in any of those zones, he was danger close to those zones. And like I always tell people, you see these maps and they say flood limit line or something like that. Mother nature has no idea where those lines are. She doesn't care. She goes wherever she wants. And so I told him, if you're going to buy this property, understand that you live five feet away from a flood zone, five feet. So it could definitely come and visit you someday. So that's a risk that you are going to be taking. Now you can buy flood insurance, even if you're not in a special flood hazard zone, but he decided against it. The fact that he was so close to wetlands and a flood uh, uh, area, he didn't want to take the risk and he bought a different house. And that's due diligence right there. Um, so as far as uh, what recourse they have, you know, uh, if it's what they call avulsion, which I didn't talk about, avulsion is the sudden change in property, like what's, what happened during Sandy. You can replace that land and bulkhead it and preserve it and no title changes hands. The sudden change in the land because of climate issues or climate uh, conditions is not, does not change title at all. But you have to act pretty quickly. And we did in New Jersey after Sandy, people were allowed to come back in, rebuild what they had, refill what they had, rebuild their bulkheads with uh, a very limited permitting, um, which we call it, and, uh, and we're able to retain now. If, you're, if you didn't do it for five years because you didn't have the money to do it, and if you come back five years later, yeah, there's, they're not going to be as lenient. They're not going to say, oh, yeah, don't worry about it. It was lost by Sandy. No, you didn't do anything for five years. Where you been? Um, and you'll have to go through the same regulatory process that uh, anybody else would go to normally. We've got one more in the Q&A there, Joe. Do you see it? Right. So it says part of South Amboy is from dredging. The channels are partially from the New York side. Is this an interesting issue like Delaware and New Jersey side? So, um, you know, as far as the dredging is concerned, you know, a lot of it depends upon exactly where they pull the, the, the sand out of. Uh, the, the state of New Jersey, their attitude is if you dredge any of the land offshore of New Jersey, you have to pay for it, okay? You have to pay per cubic yard for that dirt and take it away and put it somewhere else. So it's possible at the time they may have paid New York for that dredging, or it might have been just over the line in New Jersey, and then they paid New Jersey for the, the dredging. But dredging is a big deal. You can't just go out and dredge. That, that's the thing that people don't understand. There's ownership and then there's, uh, there's regulation. So even though you might have a riparian grant that runs out into the water and you own the land under the water, you still can't disturb the land because the land under the water is a viable ecosystem and that is regulated by the state of New Jersey. So even though you own that property underwater, you're still gonna have to go to New Jersey to get a permit because they're looking at it from an ecological standpoint an environmental standpoint and saying, if, what are you going to do? And it may be that under where you're going to put a dock is some sort of special vegetation or worse yet, a shell fishery. They will not let you touch shell fisheries in this state. And, and the good news is our shell fisheries are coming back after years and years of being lost to pollution. Uh, there's a huge effort in New Jersey we have, we have permits coming before us all the time, what they call um, uh, wildlife uh, management uh, agreements, where a group like the Delaware River Greenway Partnership will come in and apply for a management agreement so that they can go down and restock uh, uh, a, a shellfish area or 
or something like that, grow a particular type of grass or something of that nature to bring back the, the ecosystem. So, um, and so the mud on the baseballs, last that I heard, still comes from down in an area around Red Bank, New Jersey on the Delaware. And that's, that's what I've heard. I've heard some people want to change that, but last I heard, it still comes from New Jersey because even our mud is the best. <laughs> sorry, sorry for you folks from other states out there. I'm a New Jersey boy, uh, born and raised. That's my understanding too, Joseph. Um, probably less controversial than Mets, Yankees, but the mud <laughs> is from New Jersey and uh, we're sticking to it. Um, it's been such a pleasure having you this evening. We're so thankful that you could join us. A uh, big virtual round of applause from everybody in the audience. Um, we've recorded the program this evening. It's going to be posted on our website, DelawareRiverGroomatePartnership.org, under past events. And uh, feel free to share it with your friends and family. It's kind of linked on YouTube there so anybody can access it. It's going to be posted in a few days here. Um, if anybody has any other questions that we weren't able to address tonight, you can email us back at the link that you used to, uh, to register for the program this evening. We have another program coming up next month, just a short plug for it on January 18th. We'll be hearing a program from Beth Brown at the Delaware River Basin Commission entitled Our Shared Waters, a History of Improving Water Quality Through Partnership. Um, so I hope you can join us. I put the link in the chat, learn more about that program and register. Uh, again, Joseph, our sincere thank you for joining us this evening, and that's going to conclude our evening. I hope everybody has a great night. And have a wonderful holiday. Bye-bye.